Hey, he's back. If Richard Simmons once wasn't enough, we got him again. And because it's our bumper video for the series, you're going to see him at least eight more times, right? So if you're new, I mean, yeah, if you're new, if you're visiting with us, my name's Dave Hensley. Um, I spend most of my time, especially the last couple of months, over on the kids' side of the house, about neck deep in kids, teaching kids about God, who God is, uh, just teaching kids that it's good to come to church. It's good to have fun in church, to not bore them with who God is. And over there in kids, we teach them some things like uh, last week, we taught the little guys, you know, we ask them who is mighty, and they say God is mighty, and they give you big muscles. And so if you find a couple of the little toddlers and you ask them who is mighty, don't be surprised if you get God is mighty. And that's kind of what we do and what we do over in kids. But now, today we're over here and we're launching our series Motivate. And the idea behind Motivate is it's a series organized, geared around eight script stories from Scripture, eight stories from the Bible that will motivate you to be in Scripture over the summer. You know, you get it, you know, eight, motivate. It's, it's clever. Nobody laughs. That's okay. Awkward. Ha ha. That's fantastic. That's kind of how I feel when I watch Richard Simmons, so we're cool. But uh, something that Jeff kind of hit on is it's military Sunday. It's Sunday before you know, Memorial Day weekend. It's a Sunday before the day that our nation honors the fallen military and the, the current serving military and those that have served. And Awaken, we hear around here in Awaken, we hear this, you know, we hear just kick around this healing in, raising up, sending out, right? We see that a lot. It's on our banners. It's, it's in our programs. It's everywhere you look. And really that raising up part, I'm, me, I'm, I'm a uh, direct product of that raising up sort of thing. Because three years ago, the Sunday before Memorial Day weekend, three, four years ago, I would not have believed you if you'd have said, Dave, you're going to be on stage in a church delivering a message to a group of people to motivate them to be in Scripture because I didn't know who God was. I wasn't in Scripture. I would have laughed at you if you had told me that was what was going to happen because I was in the military. I'm a retired Navy guy and was doing the Navy thing. It's what we did. You know, I mean, I was just living life, being in the Navy. And so if you had told me on a Memorial Day Sunday three or four years ago that this is what I was going to be doing, I would have completely laughed you out of the room. But we're here, and we're going to talk about motivate. And what, we, what I really want to land on, if we're going to use the word motivate, well, what does that mean? What, where does that come from? What do we got there? And there's some words that go with motivate, some synonyms, some different words to use. Because if you use the word to define the word, well, that's just bad English for one. And two, it just doesn't work out. So here's some different words for motivate. To inspire, to stimulate, to encourage, persuade, to arouse, to influence, to prompt, to incite, the dictionary definition of motivate says, you know, to give a meaning. So through this series, Motivate, what we're wanting to do, our goal is to give you eight stories from Scripture, eight stories from the Bible that will inspire you to be in Scripture, to motivate you to be in Scripture. Because the summer's here. I mean, tomorrow, Memorial Day, really is like the kickoff for summer. Memorial Day is what really sort of starts our summer season, and when summer starts, the pace of life changes. It gets a little hectic. It can get a little busy. It goes from the kids aren't in school to the kids are in baseball. And that means that there's baseball practice that you got to get the kids to. And the kids are in soccer and there's soccer practice. And then there's the beach, there's the pool, there's cookouts, there's amusement parks. I mean, we got Bush Gardens just right up the road. And I know we got some roller coaster fanatics in the audience. Yeah. So there's all these things that kind of change the pace of life. And maybe over this last winter, you know, because it was a long and kind of a cold winter, but over this last winter, maybe for the first time here at Awaken, you were learning who God is and you were being raised up because God is mighty and God is awesome and He reached in and He's got a hold of your life and He's connected with you and you're in Scripture and you're starting to develop those spiritual disciplines and you're in a community group and you're connecting with people. And now summer's coming and maybe there are some distractions that are starting to pull you, you know, a little off the path. Or maybe you've been following God for a while and the summer's here and the honeydew list is kicking in and you've got to mulch the flower buds and cut the grass and clean out the gutters and the lawnmower's not behaving. And it's, so there's these things that want to pull us away from the quiet time that we have developed with Scripture and with God. Or maybe, maybe this is your first time in a long time in church or ever. And you're here because somebody was like, man, I'll buy you lunch. Just come hang out with me. You've got to see this. This is awesome. God, you know. 
there's some really great stuff happening here. Maybe you're here and you don't know who really who God is, and you're starting to wonder maybe who God is. Maybe you don't really believe what we believe. But it is my hope that Motivate will prompt you, will inspire you, maybe persuade you to take a look into Scripture and start to see who the God of the universe is. See that He has a plan for your life, that you were made on purpose, with a purpose, for a purpose, and that that God of the universe is really there for us. But to do that, we've got to get to our story, right? Because I could talk all day about the word motivate and get us absolutely nowhere. So today, our story, we're going to spend our whole time in the book of Nehemiah. It's in the Old Testament. If you start in the left and start working your way to your right, you're going to come across Ezra. The book after that is Nehemiah. If you get to Psalms, you've gone too far, start backing up. There's that groovy table of contents thing in there. Or if you're in the 21st century, you break out your version app, and it's all right there. You know, just a couple of finger pokes and in it to win it. I got some people down here modeling the version thing for me. That's neat. But that's going to be in the book of Nehemiah. And see, Nehemiah, Nehemiah is a guy who grew up hearing stories. Nehemiah grew, was a guy who grew up hearing God is great. He grew up hearing God is awesome. He grew up hearing the, hearing the words, you know, God is powerful. God is mighty. He grew up hearing the stories of how God took and created a nation from one, hundred year old, from one guy that was 100 years old and his 90-year-old wife. He grew up eating the Passover feast and hearing the stories at Passover about how God, with a mighty hand, reached down into the nation of Egypt where God's people were in slavery and bondage. And he killed all the firstborn in Egypt, except those people where the blood of the lamb was splashed on the doorpost. And so he heard those stories at Passover. And he heard at the Passover feast when they tell the stories about how God is awesome and God is mighty. How God raised up a guy named Moses. And God's people followed Moses out of Egypt. Moses led him out of Egypt. And how with the Red Sea in front of them, it's deep and it's impassable. And behind them comes the Pharaoh's chariots thundering down on them. And their backs against the wall. They got nowhere to go. God had led them to this point, a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. And so they're at this point, and they don't know where to go. God's mighty hand opens the waves. And God's people cross on dry land, and then they watched as the waves drowned Pharaoh's army. So Nehemiah hears these stories every Passover feast. But he's not living in the land of promise. You see, Nehemiah is the son of a captive people. Nehemiah is a man who was born not in the land of promise, but he was born in captivity. He was born in Babylon. He wasn't born in Israel. He wasn't born in Judah. He wasn't born in Jerusalem, the city of David. And so Nehemiah grows up as a captive, as an exile, really, hearing all these stories about how God is great, how God is mighty, how God is awesome. And he's, you know, there's a lot of stories between the Exodus and where Nehemiah is at in his day in the city of Susa, the city of Lilies, serving the king of Persia, who at this time is the most powerful man in the world. And so, <clears throat> Nehemiah is the guy who lives in exile. Now, there's two words I want to latch on to here that will help us, 4,000 years later, really identify with Nehemiah, an exile in Persia. Two words, for now. For now are two words that really sort of give life to living in exile, because it becomes, well, I'm a captive for now, because God is great and mighty, and he's going to deliver us out of this. So for now, I'm a captive. But you see, Nehemiah's for now wasn't like a present for now. It wasn't like one day he was out riding his bicycle, and along came the Persians, scooped those people up, and took them to Susa. Nehemiah's for now is a generational for now. It's 160 years of for now. For 160 years, God's people have been captive in Babylon, and Nehemiah is one of them. And yes, yeah, sure, at this point, for Nehemiah, for now isn't too arduous, it isn't too egregious, because for now means Nehemiah is living in Susa, and it's gotten to a point where he has risen to a place of, in, of influence, of prominence. Uh, Nehemiah is the cupbearer to the king. That means that Nehemiah has wealth. He has privilege. He has a big house. He has servants. He has the ear of the king, because the king's cupbearer was a trusted counselor. He was one of the few people that was allowed to see the face of the king in Persia. And here Nehemiah is. He's a Hebrew, a captured people, living in exile, and he is one of the closest advisors to the most powerful man in the known world. So his for now is a little different kind of for now. 
Does anybody here live with for now? You know, I'm, I'll tell you what. Just say it with me. Say for now. For now. One more time. Say it for now. For now. So, so for now, I'm a student. Does anybody live with for now I'm a student? Right, right. If you're in middle school, if you're in high school, if you're in college, then you live with for now. For now I'm a student. And if for now you're a student, you're also living with for now, I, money's kind of tight. Because I don't know who, too many students that are rolling in dough, right? They're, they're, you're living with for now. So for now, money is tight. For now, the economy is rough. You know, or maybe it's for now, I'm working this job. It's not my favorite job, but it puts bread on the table. So for now, I'm working this job until something better comes along. Or maybe it's, you know, for now, for now, my relationship's a mess. Or for now, my kids are going off the rails. For now, I have a teenager that just isn't making great decisions. But it's a for now. You know, maybe, maybe your for now is the for now, you know, for now I'm a single parent, or for now I'm divorced, or for now I'm single. Or maybe it's even, you know, for now I'm depressed, I'm sad. You can name a thousand situations, and I'm sure every one of us is either living in a for now or about to live in a for now. It's just those two words that sort of characterize a tough place, a tough spot in our life. And I want us to connect that with Nehemiah. And you're probably thinking, man, my for now and his for now ain't the same for now. You know, my for now is money is tight. His for now is he's one of the most powerful people in Persia because he has the ear of the king. How is that the same for now? We're going to get to that in a minute, you know, in a little bit in the future, in the for now. As you see, the for now was starting to end, for at least for God's people. Thirteen years previous to this, Nehemiah's brother Hanani gets in a caravan with a scribe named Ezra and a bunch of God's people, and they head south to the city of Jerusalem. They head south to the fabled city, to David's city, the city where Solomon, the greatest, wisest king ever heard of, lived and made great and wealthy. They're headed back to the land of promise, out of captivity. And Nehemiah's brother Hanani gets on the caravan. Nehemiah stays behind. We don't know why. Maybe Nehemiah was on the way up the ladder in the palace and he didn't hop on the caravan. Or maybe he couldn't hop on the caravan because the king decides who stays and who goes. And so 13 years ago, Han and I makes this trip to Jerusalem with Ezra to rebuild the temple, to rebuild God's house. But now, 13 years later, Nehemiah's brother's back in town. Nehemiah's brother came into town on a caravan. And they're catching up. I mean, it's been 13 years, so there's a lot of catching up to do. I mean, there was probably some letters exchanged back and forth. But there's a lot of detail that you just don't have time to sit down and write when you're rebuilding something. And so Han and I and Nehemiah are catching up. I mean, picture them. They're walking through the gardens in Susa. Susa, in the old language, meant city of lilies. So it's a beautiful place. It's a city of flowers and green and water and you know in plenty and the palace is everything that the city should be it embodies all of these things it's a beautiful place and here is Han and I he's travel stained he's road weary his sandals have got patches in him his clothes are dusty imagine the dust of the road still on him the smell of the desert air still in his nostrils and he's sitting with Nehemiah in the garden and he's sitting in the shade maybe where the mist from a fountain will blow on him maybe there's some servants with palm fronds to kind of cool them because Nehemiah is a man of wealth and influence, and Nehemiah is trying to do, you know, give his brother some rest, maybe. But they're sitting there and they're catching up. And you know how it is when you catch up. You make some small talk. You talk about the weather. You talk about, uh, you know, the trip. You know, there's a lot of things you talk about. Well, eventually, at some point, they get around to the central question. And Nehemiah looks at Hannah and I, and he's like, Hannah and I, how's it going? How goes the rebuilding? How, how, are, how are our people? How are there people that survived the captivity, had survived the exile? How are they doing? How is the rebuilding going in Jerusalem? I mean, if we look at Nehemiah chapter 1, we get the sort of like the journal entry here, which is somewhat devoid of the emotion. But I'm going to give you the journal entry, and then we're going to get back to the story. And it says, Now it happened in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, that Han and I, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came and asked, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are, are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down 
and its gates are burned with fire. So, Nehemiah asked his brother, hey man, how's it going? How's the rebuilding going? How's the project? It's been 13 years, man, how's it going? And, and Hanani looks at his brother and he's like, you know, truth be told, not good. Not well. The place is a mess. The walls are in rubble. They're in pieces. No stone stands upon another. Brambles and vines are growing through the walls. Our city is a mess, Nehemiah. The gates have been burned with fire. Our city's a joke. Us, we're God's people and we're a joke. The bandits, they can come and take whatever they want. The Ammonites, the Samaritans, the Arabs, they just come and they can take. And they can raid because we have no city walls. And this, this answer, it, it absolutely wrecks Nehemiah. Because Nehemiah's name, you know what Nehemiah means in the Hebrew? Nehemiah means Jehovah comforts. So every day of his life when he hears Nehemiah, he hears Jehovah comforts. He's reminded God is great. God is mighty. God is here for you. God is in control. God has chosen us as a people. We are God's chosen people. You know, Jeho Jehovah comforts. And here he is living in wealth and plenty. And his brother Han and I is in a city of ruins. A city where the walls don't stand and the gates have been burned with fire. And that answer wrecks Nehemiah. And that's how we know that Nehemiah is living in for now. Because a guy that doesn't live in for now, that's comfortable with the wealth and the power and the privilege... That guy probably thinks, man, that sucks. <laughs> hey, man, better you than me, Hananiah. Better you than me, bro. Uh, tell me if I can do something for you. And goes back to his wealth and, wealth and privilege, but not, not Nehemiah. And here we see Nehemiah's response, how it really wrecked Nehemiah. We look at Nehemiah 1.4. It says, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I beseech you, O Lord of God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant of loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open and hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now day and night on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants. Nehemiah is broken when his brother says for now. You know, when his brother, when he recognizes the for now, when he recognizes the mess that his brother and the God's people are living in. Have you ever... Ask somebody, hey, how's it going? Somebody kind of close to you, somebody you, you care about, and you say, hey, how's it going? And they give you an answer, and it just it, it stabs you right in your very core. It just rips your heart out. Or most likely, more likely, what happens to me more often than not, is somebody asks me, hey, man, how's it going? And I stop, and instead of giving them the standard, hey, man, it's going good. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing great. And I stop, and I think, how's it going? Man, it's, going, it's not going so good. When you stop and you think about it, when they say, how's it going? And you're like, well, really, it's not going well. And that answer, to think about the answer, it just wrecks you. It just takes you to a, a place you don't want to be. And maybe today somebody here is sitting here and they're for now. is starting to feel like forever. And you're for now. When somebody asked you, how's it going this morning, it, it wrecked you because you thought about the answer and it hurt because you don't like where you're at. You know, for now, it feels like forever. The walls are down. There's rubble everywhere. The gates are burned with fire. You feel like life is a joke and like it's never going to get better. Let me tell you, you're in a fantastic place. That's a great place to be. And you're probably thinking, man, you're nuts. How is feeling like my life is a joke and it's not going to get better? Great. But here's why. It's a great place to be because it's in this place of brokenness, in this place of wreck and ruin that there's room for God to move. There's room to start a great work, a room to, re to start a rebuilding process. You see, it's in this wreck, it's in this ruin where the walls are down and the gates are burned with fire that God takes us from for now to was. He transforms from now into was. He transforms from now into used to be. It's in this place where God takes our mourning and he turns it into dancing. He takes those ashes and he transforms them into victory. But it doesn't just happen. You don't find yourself in a for now and then all of a sudden, bam, everything's better. Because you have to do, you have to kind of do what Nehemiah did. You see, Nehemiah was wrecked by the for now. And he got down on his knees before God and he wept and he prayed. 
And he invited God into the middle of the for now, because that is really in a rebuilding process. If we're going to connect with Nehemiah, if we're going to connect with a guy that lived 4,000 years ago, if we're going to be motivated to be in Scripture, we are going to need to connect with the for now and with the process that's useful to us. And the first step in rebuilding your for now to moving from for now to was is to invite God into the middle of your for now. To take and say, God, this, this is bad. Help me. And now Nehemiah doesn't just pray that prayer one time. He doesn't pray it two times. He prays it for two whole months. He's on his knees before God. And he's crying out to God and he's reminding God. He's saying, God, you're great. You're mighty. We are your people, God. You've got to deliver us from this. God, help me to get through this. Now there's something else that Nehemiah is doing here in this time frame. And it's, it's the next step in a rebuilding process, of rebuilding any area of your life. Step one is inviting God in. Step two, man, you've got to be ready to move because when God moves, you've got to be ready to move with God. If God moves and you're not ready to move with God, it's going to be tough. God's still going to move. God's still going to do great things. But it's going to be a lot tougher to catch up. It's going to be a lot tougher to get done what you want to get done, what you need to get done, what God wants you to get done if you're not ready to move when God says move. And so Nehemiah, in this process, he's planning. He's, he's scheming. He's dreaming. He's putting together of what I'm going to do if I get an opportunity. And throughout this prayer, the prayer that I started to read you, it's a much longer prayer. It takes up the rest of Nehemiah 1. But at the end of it, he's, he's asking God, God, give me favor with this man. And he's talking about the king. Because remember, Nehemiah is a man of influence and wealth. He has the ear of the king. He's the cupbearer to the king. And so we kind of pick up our story back over here in Nehemiah 2. It says, so the king said to me, why is your face sad, though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. And then I was very much afraid. Nehemiah is afraid because to be sad before the king was an offense you could be executed for. To be the cupbearer to the king, to be the guy who tastes the king's wine to make sure it ain't poisoned. If you're looking sad, maybe there's a little something in the wine the king shouldn't be drinking. Maybe you're part of a plot to unseat the king. The king doesn't know, and if his closest advisor is untrustworthy, well, that guy gets the ax real quick. Because politics in those days wasn't run for election, you lost, and you went off to Texas to write books. In those days, if you were the king and you lost the power, you didn't live to go anywhere. You were poisoned, you were stabbed, you were murdered, you were deposed and thrown in chains. It was a bad day. So for Nehemiah to be sad before the king was a pretty big risk. And when the king notices it and he says, Nehemiah, why are you sad before me? It's not because you're sick. You're healthy as a horse. This can be nothing but sickness of heart. And Nehemiah says, I was very afraid. He was afraid. But he gets a grip on that fear and he moves forward because he's been planning. This is the moment. This is God giving him an in. This is God giving him a chance to move and he's moving with God. And he says, I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs lies desolate and its gates have been consumed with fire. And then the king said to me, what do you request? And so I prayed to the God of heaven. So here it is. Nehemiah is before the king. He's serving the king the wine. And it's a, you know, it's just tough. It's been two months of praying and begging God to be in part of the for now and part of the mess. And the king says, Nehemiah, why are you sad? Nehemiah says, well, why shouldn't I be sad? My people live in a destroyed city. The city's a mess. It's terrible. Why shouldn't I be sad? And so the king's like, well, what do you want? Then this is the chance that Nehemiah has been waiting for. This is that opportunity. This is the move when God says move. And so the king says, what do you want? And Nehemiah shoots up a priest and says, I prayed to the God of heaven. And this wasn't a two-month, you know, repetitive God give me a hand here. It was God, I hope this works. Anybody ever been in that position where you're getting ready to launch something, you're getting ready to jump on something new, or you're just stepping out in faith, and you're like, boy, God, I sure hope this works. Please, God, let this work. That's where Nehemiah is. And he says to the king, send me to build the city. Send me to rebuild the walls. I, you trust me. I've never done anything but give you good advice. Send me to rebuild the walls. Now, of course, we have the Nehemiah journal entry. It's not the full conversation. But basically what he says is, if it please the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, so at the city of my father's tombs, that I might rebuild it. And then the king says to him, hey, how long, how long do you need? And Nehemiah, he's got a plan. He tells the king how long it's going to take. And the king's like, all right. And Nehemiah's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute before you jump on this. 
there's some other things I'm going to need. I'm going to need letters to get me from Susa to Jerusalem because there's governors between here and there. I've got to pass through their territory, and it's a long way, and I'm going to need support. And then I'm going to need you to write a letter to the keeper of the king's forest because I'm going to need a lot of wood, a lot of timber to rebuild these burned gates. And I'm going to need a place to stay because if you haven't noticed, if you haven't got the message or the reports, Jerusalem's a mess, and I'm going to need a place to live while I'm putting the place back together. And the king, he, he grants Nehemiah's request, and he even does one better. He says, you know, Nehemiah writes in his journal how the king gave him all these things, and he gave him officers from the army and horsemen. So the king's like, man, you're done. Done deal. It's yours, Nehemiah. How long is it going to take you? Okay, fine. You, you go do this. Here's the letters you asked for. Here's the support you asked for. Here's a posse to take with you, because it's a long road. It's a dangerous road, and when you get there, there may be some resistance. So here's some men to take with you. So now if we're in a movie, if this is a movie we're watching on the screen, the camera kind of pans back and there's this great hustle and bustle and there's a caravan being put together and there's camels and there's horses and there's wagons and there's little kids running around and there's soldiers on their horses and it's kind of a festive party sort of atmosphere and the music swells and the caravan heads out and they make that long journey to Jerusalem. It's sort of a montage camping, you know, campfires and food and maybe some bandit attacks. We really don't know. Nehemiah doesn't bother to tell us about it. But what happens is that Nehemiah gets to Jerusalem. And now here's the point where the villains are introduced. Our villains have some names. Our villains' names are Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. Say them with me. Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. All right. These are bad guys. These are not good guys. These are some of the guys that really stand to benefit from the walls of Jerusalem being down and being a mess. And here's what we get in Nehemiah 2, in his journal entry, Nehemiah 2.10. It says, When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about it, it was very displeasing to them that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. So enter the villains, enter the bad guys, bum, 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 you know, big twirly, twirly, curly mustaches. They've got it in for Nehemiah or whoever it is that's coming to help rebuild the city, to give the sons of Israel some security, to give them a place where they can't, there won't be a joke anymore. They'll, they'll really be able to represent God again. And so Nehemiah surveys the walls. He doesn't tell anybody what he's doing. He goes out at night. He takes one horse with him, a few guys, and he circuits the whole of the city of Jerusalem. And he looks at the walls, and he sees where the rubble is, and he sees where the thorns and the vines have grown up over the rocks. And he sees where the gates have been burned with fire, and he sees that a lot of the small stone has probably been carried away for the people who survived the destruction of Jerusalem to rebuild some semblance of life in the ruins. And he looks at that, and then he gets back and he gathers together the people of Jerusalem and he gives them yeah, a motivational speech. He gathers them together and it's not one of those brave heart moments, you know, sons of Scotland kind of thing. We're not charging the fields of Bannockburn here. What we're doing, what he's doing is he's gathering the people together and he's just let, he's, he's, he's going to rally them around the project, the great work. It says, Then I said to them, You see the bad situation we are in, that Jerusalem is desolate and its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. And I told them how the hand of God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words that he had spoke to me. And then they said, Let us arise and build. And so they put their hands to the good work. Now, he says, You see the mess we're in. It's not like these people didn't see the rubble. They've been living in the rubble for years. For generations, they'd been living in the rubble. Their 160 years for now was 160 years of, some of them had been in the rubble. Their families had been in this rubble. Most of them had been there for at least 13 years that we know of because they came in a caravan with Ezra to rebuild the temple. That rubble is not new. It wasn't like somebody backed up a dump truck and gave them some new rubble. It's been there a long time, and Nehemiah's just drawing their attention back to it. You see the mess you're in. You see where we're at. Let's gather together. Let's rebuild. Let's stop being a joke. And when we're rebuilding in our life, when we start to we find that area, we find that for now, we've invited God into it. And we start to move when God moves. God's going to draw attention to the rubble. God's going to say, hey, do you see the mess you're in? 
And it's not shouldn't be a surprise to us. I mean, when God says, "Hey, Dave, look at the mess you're in," that's it's not new to me. It's been my it's my mess. I made it. But it needs the attention focused on it for me to start to rebuild. And now this is the difference that we're going to run into between the Holy Spirit working in our lives and the enemy. Because we have an enemy. Just like Nehemiah has Samballat, Tobiah, and Geshem lurking somewhere in the background. All too often we fail to take into account that we have an enemy lurking in the background. And Peter says he's prowling about like a lion. He's waiting, looking for someone to devour. And that's the same thing. Except that when we look at the rubble, the Holy Spirit says, here's the mess. I'm going to give you the strength and the power to clean it up. It doesn't have to stay this way. The enemy comes and says, look at the mess. How are you going to clean up anything? You can't even get this right. That's the difference between condemnation and conviction. And so Nehemiah is convicting. He's saying, hey, here's the mess. Let's work together. Let's get it fixed. And so they start the rebuilding process. And it's a very unlikely group of people that rebuild this city. You've got potters working alongside masons and carpenters. You've got jewelers and perfume makers whose hands have never seen a hard day's labor in their life. Swinging shovels and trowels. These guys are getting blisters in places they didn't know you could get blisters. These guys are sore in places they didn't know they could be sore. But they're working together. And they're really, really digging into this great work. And the same can be said for us. When we start in that for now, we start moving on that great work. We're going to start working in some unlikely places and we're probably going to get some spiritual blisters in places we didn't know we could get spiritual blisters. But it's part of the great work. Well, here is where Sanballat, Geshem, and Tobiah really kind of come into play. We jump over to Nehemiah 4, and here are our good friends over here in 4, 1, and 3. One through three, I'm sorry. It says, now it, became, now it came about that when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and angry and mocked the Jews. And he spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria, and he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it by themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burned ones? And now Tobiah the Ammonite was nearby, remember? Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. Tobiah is kind of like his, I just picture him as this kind of little Danny DeVito, penguin kind of, you know, bad guy in my mind. And he says, even what they are building, if a fox should jump up on it, he will break their stone wall down. So here comes the enemy. And the enemy doesn't start off with, you know, let's steal their tools and screw with them. The enemy comes up and he starts to demoralize. He says, do you see what these feeble Jews are doing? And I mean, he doesn't, I mean, he does it in public. He doesn't just come to Nehemiah. He comes to the people doing the work. He comes to them in the middle of the work, in the middle of the day. They're tired, they're thirsty, they're dusty, their hands are blistered. And he says, look at what you guys are doing. You're not even masons and carpenters. This is a joke. What, are you going to build this in a day? Look at the work you've got to do. If a fox jumps up on this wall, he's going to knock it down. What are you doing? Now, here's something I want us to really pay attention to here. Look at Nehemiah's response. Nehemiah, once again, discouragement is coming in. The enemy is coming at him. And what does Nehemiah do? Now, my temptation would be to run out and, you know, stick my thumb in Sanballat's eye. That would probably shut him up right fast. But that's going to distract from the work. Well, Nehemiah doesn't do that. Nehemiah simply says this. He says, Here, O oh our God, how we are despised. Return the reproach, the reproach on their heads and give them up for plunder in a land of captivity. Do not... Forgive their iniquity. Do not let their sin be blotted out before you, for they have demoralized the builders. Nehemiah just invites God back into the for now. He says, hey, God, do you see what they're doing to us? They're demoralizing the builders. Man, turn us back on their heads. Let them feel some of what we felt. And then he gets back to work. And so they continue to work. And the work progresses. And then here comes Sanballat, Geshem, and Tobiah again. Now when Samballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites had heard the repair of the walls of Jerusalem went on, and that the breaches began to be closed, they were very angry, and all of them conspired together to come and fight against Jerusalem, and to cause a disturbance in it. Okay, now it's getting real. Now it's getting serious. The enemy is no longer just poking fun. The enemy is no longer making personal attacks, 
and trying to demoralize the workers. Now the enemy says, you know what, this obviously isn't working. Let's just go kill a bunch of them. Let's go take a bunch of them out. It's sort of a mafia, Tony Soprano, Don Corleone sort of moment where they say, hey, this ain't working. This wise guy's not getting it. Let's just go whack a bunch of them. And the people hear it because they want the people to hear it. Because if they think their life is in jeopardy, maybe they'll quit, they'll stop the project, they'll stop the work, they'll just walk away because they don't want to die. But what the bad guys fail to take into account, what the enemy fails to take into account, because the enemy's going to come at us the same way. He's going to find ways to make us feel like if we keep doing what God has called us to do, we're going to die. He's going to make us feel like we can't go a step further. If we go another step, it's going to be the end of us. And that's what they're trying to do with the people in Jerusalem. And now Nehemiah has this brave heart moment. Now Nehemiah gathers them together. He posts some guards. He gets out the weapons. He's handing swords to guys who, you know, the, the most dangerous thing they've ever held in their life was a lump of clay because they make a pot out of the thing. Or maybe the most dangerous thing they've ever held was a little knife they used to cut up their food. He's giving these guys weapons, and they're not soldiers. And he gathers them together, and he says to them, When I saw their fear, I rose and spoke to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, and said, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Nehemiah gathers the people together, and he says, Don't be afraid of them. A fight's going to come our way. Here's the weapons. Be ready to fight, but remember who fights for you. Remember who gives you the strength and the power to fight. Remember who is on our side. Remember the God who is great and awesome. He's on our side. He's going to fight for us. We've got half a wall here. Most of the breaches are closed. We're going to stand in front of our houses. We're going to stand with our sisters and our brothers and our kids and our wives, and we're going to defend them. We're going to fight. If there's going to be blood, then let there be blood, but remember who does the fighting for us. And then he tells the people, okay, now get back to work. Get back to work. Look, turn to the person next to you, touch three people around you, say, get back to work. Tell them, get back to work. Get back to work. That's right, get back to work. And so the work progresses. And the walls keep going up. And our friends, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, they see the walls. They see the people are prepared to defend the walls. They're prepared to shed blood. They're prepared, okay, if a fight's going to come, fine. We're going to fight. And God fights with us, so you bring what you got. You're not going to like how this turns out. And so they take a step back, because that's what the enemy does. The enemy comes at us. He comes at us in our rebuilding process, and he latches onto us, and he tries to threaten us and to scare us off. And when we turn to God and we say, God is great and mighty, God is powerful. When we say, who is mighty? God is mighty. When we remind ourselves who God is, the enemy sees that, and the enemy knows, man, he can't whip us if God's fighting for us. The enemy can't beat God. He's not going to beat anybody God empowers. And so he takes a step back, and he changes tactics, which is what's going to happen next. The enemy is going to change the tactics. He's going to flip it around. He figures, okay, here's the deal. We, the enemy, they sand ballot to buy a Geshem, they get together, they have a little huddle up, a little mafia powwow, and they say, you know, the problem isn't the potters and the goldsmiths and the weavers and the perfume makers and the priests and the scribes. They've, those guys have been there a long time, and we've been able to do whatever we want with them. The real problem is this Nehemiah guy. The real problem is this guy that's wanting to rebuild. This real problem is this guy that is inspiring them and pulling them together and leading them, reminding them that they have a God who is great and awesome, reminding them that God says that they are his people and pulling them together. So here's what we're going to do. We're just going to take out Nehemiah. We're going to get him alone. We're going to get him to come away. And we're going to take him out. And that will solve all our problems because then we can go back to doing whatever we want with these people. And here, here again is the old Nehemiah journal entry. And he's kind of non, he just kind of downplays it. But this is what he writes. And this is where I want to, stick for the rest of this Sunday morning because this is the serious stuff. It says, Now when it was reported to Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arab and to the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and that no breach remained in it, although at that time I had not set up the doors and the gates, then Sanballat and Geshem sent a message to me saying, Come down and let us meet together 
at Sephirim in the plain of Ono. But they were planning to harm me. I think it's kind of funny that they're going to invite him down to a village in the plain of Ono, and that's where they're going to whack him. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it translates into English as, oh, you know, for me, it's, oh, no. Say with me, oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. You're not going to get me like that. That's what Nehemiah is saying. He's saying, oh, no, no. That's what they want him to do. They want him to come down. They're going to lure him into this village, and they're going to do him harm. And that's what the enemy's going to try to do to you. That's what he's going to do to me. That's what he tries to do to us all the time as he reaches the point where he can't get us where we're at. So he's just going to try to bring us to his area, bring us into where he can get at us. And there's a lot of ways that that can happen. You see, Nehemiah has Tobiah, Geshem, and Sanballat. His enemies have names and faces. His enemies eventually will die of old freaking age. Eventually, his enemies will may give up and go away. We have different enemies. We have, we have a very real enemy. But we have some other enemies. We have distraction, disappointment, and discouragement. When you read Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, translate their names into distraction, disappointment, and discouragement. Because those are our enemies. Distraction, disappointment, and discouragement. Because the enemy of our soul, the devil, he comes at us and he, con- he, he, he condemns. He tries to distract us with things that we really should not be doing. He discourages us when we sometimes engage him in those areas. Or he waits for something to not break our way, to not happen in the time that we think it should happen, and then he uses the disappointment as a lever to bring us down to that area of, oh no. Well, here's Nehemiah's response, and this is where I really want us to dig in. It says, so I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop when I leave it and come down to you? They sent messages to me four times in this manner, and I answered them in the same way. So he says to the enemy, he sends them a messenger. He doesn't even talk to them in person. He just sends a messenger. He says, I am doing a great work. And I cannot come down. Why should the work stop? Because I've come down to meet with you. So I want you to say this with me. Say, I am doing a great work. And I cannot come down. All right, we're going to stick with that. I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. So where are some areas that the enemy is trying to get us to come down? (laughs) What? Somebody talked back to me. That's awesome. I didn't even have to pay her to do it. That's fantastic. <laughs> what are some areas that the enemy wants us to come down, that wants us to engage where he can cut us off, can, in the language of Peter, like a lion, jump on us and devour us? Where is that at? Maybe, maybe for some of us it's websites that we shouldn't be looking at. Or maybe for some of us it's that, uh, you know, that cold, frosty beverage that's been calling our name and we ain't touched it in years. Or maybe it's something simple. Maybe it's just your, you know... Anger gets the better of you. And when you come down off the wall and you engage in the anger, and you engage in the self-centeredness that develops that anger, that's where the enemy can pick you off, where he's brought you down to the plane of Ono to assassinate you, to drag you into a whole new for now. Maybe that's where that's at. You know, maybe that's, that's how that works. And maybe that's, that's where we really need to land. You see... I'm going to sit for a minute, but God, and Mike warned me about this and other guys that have talked to me about preaching and about doing what I'm doing and learning to do, is that when you go to give a message on something, be prepared for God to qualify you to give that message. When you go to do something that God's called you to do, be ready for God to, to, to qualify you to do it. It's been said that God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. So in that for now, when you invite God in and you start to move, be ready because it's coming. And so this whole week, I'm trying to put this message together and I'm thinking about this idea of for now and moving from for now into was. And darned if I didn't go ahead and find some for nows that I thought were wases. I thought was used to be. You know, I let my disappointment and my anger get the better of me. 
and damage and, and further damage relationships that I'm trying to rebuild. And I let uh, let some distractions pull me away from what I'm doing. I found other things that just every turn I turned, every corner I turned, there was something that reminded me of who I used to be and who I was and who I'm not anymore. And it got, it was painful, it was bad for me. I mean, it put me on my knees. I was driving in the car, I looked over at my wife, Nicole, and I said, I just don't, I feel like the least qualified guy on the planet to talk about this. I don't feel like I am qualified at all to speak to a group of people about Nehemiah, about rebuilding our life, about going from for now to used to be, about doing what God has called us to do and moving in that. I just don't feel qualified. I feel like I'm a, I feel like a fake. I feel like a hypocrite because, well, oftentimes I become a hypocrite because I let the enemy pull me down on that plane of Ono and engage him there instead of staying up on the wall where God, who is great and mighty, is going to fight through me. But Nicole... Being Nicole and being somebody who God's put in my life for a long time, she put a hand on me and she said, Dave, it's in feeling unqualified that you are becoming, that you are qualified to do this. God's qualifying you to give this message right now. He's working on some stuff in you. And that's just the way it's got to be. And she prayed for me and she reminded me of who I am, who God says I am. She reminded me that God is great and mighty, that God is awesome, and that I serve the God who is great and awesome, that in my life, the rebuilding that's happening in my life is a great work. She reminded me that I'm doing a great work, and I cannot come down. <clears throat> so here's what I need us to do. This is what we all need to do. I need to do most of all. I want you to tattoo Nehemiah 6.3 on the back of your eyelids. Write it on a 3 by 5 note card. Staple it to the dash of your car. Tape it to your bathroom window. Take a Sharpie and write it on the roll of toilet paper so that's the first thing you see in the morning. Write it on the toothbrush handle. Write it on your toothpaste. Put it on your cookware. Wherever you got to put Nehemiah 6.3, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. You put it there. And you tell when distraction comes, you say, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. When disappointment comes, you say, hey, devil, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. When the disappointment comes, you tell the devil, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. You tell him, I ain't coming down. You tell the devil, I can't stop, I won't stop. Say it with me, can't stop, won't stop. Oh, come on. Let's give it some gusto here. Can't stop, won't stop. Can't stop, So you tell the devil, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. I won't come down. You can't make me come down. It ain't going to happen. I serve a God who is great and mighty. I cannot come down. Your marriage is too important to come down. The relationship with your kids is too important to come down. Your finances, your life, the work that God is doing in you, your walk with God is too important. You're doing a great work, and you cannot come down. And so what's the next step? Because if we're doing this every Sunday and we're coming together, and we're worshiping the God of the universe, and we found some for nows that need some work, then there's a next step. There's always a next step involved. Or at least there should be. So what's your next step? Maybe, maybe you're here today, and your next step is just to get in Scripture, to get some alone time with God. Maybe, maybe your next step, maybe the step in your great work is to start laying the foundation of your great work. You take God's word, you take scripture, and that's the stones, the foundation stones of the great work in your life. And you build on that day after day after day after day because you're doing a great work and you cannot come down. Maybe that's your next step. Maybe your next step is to get in a community group. Maybe you've started your great work and you're not, you know, you're, you're not coming down. But you need a group of people to walk with, to do life with. A group of unlikely people that are doing a great work together. And so you need to get, maybe your next step is just to get in a community group, to find a group of people. We got about five of them now. Plug in with them. They encourage one another. Pray with one another. Help each other when they get the blisters in places that you didn't know you could get blisters. Or maybe, maybe finally, I don't know, you're, you're new here. Your next step, you've never been in church before. You ain't been in a long time. Maybe your next step is just to say, hey, you know, Jesus, I'm tired of for now. 
my life has been one long lingering for now, Lord. I'm tired of it. And you're, you know, you're God. And you died. I'm a sinner. I'm a mess. You died for me. I know you're Lord and King. I want you to be my Lord and King. Maybe your next step is just give your life over to Christ. Maybe that's where your next step is to start your great work. And you lay the cornerstone of your great work, the cornerstone that is Jesus. You lay that in your life and you build everything else off of it. And you knock some things down and you rebuild them off that cornerstone that is Christ. You raise, out, you raise up your hand, you shout out to God, God, make me yours, I'm yours, do with me as you please. But you're my God now. Maybe that's your first step. If that's a first step, whatever your first step is, there's some stuff in your version where you can tag what your first step is. If your first step is to give your life to Christ, we have people here that would love to meet with you, to pray with you about that. Write it on your Connect card. Chuck it in the offering bucket. Everybody writes on the Connect cards. Nobody will know what you're writing. Just write it down. And somebody will get in contact with you, and we'll talk about that. Because maybe that's where the next step is. Maybe that's the beginning of the great work. Maybe that's where we start. And that's how we get to the point where we tell the devil, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Would you pray with me? Father God, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you started a great work a very long time ago, Lord. Thank you that you give us your word. And that your word is filled with examples of how it is that we are to do life with you. That you speak to us through your word, Lord. Thank you that your son, Jesus, he came. And he lived the life we couldn't live. He died in our place for our sins. Lord God, thank you that you fight for us. That you are great and mighty. That you stand between us and the enemy. That you will come into the mess if we just invite you in. Father God, just be with us as we move forward through the week. Be with us when the distraction comes, when the disappointment comes, when the discouragement comes, Lord God. Be with us. Raise us up. Give us the strength and the power to do the great work. And remind us in that distraction, in that disappointment, that discouragement, Lord. Reach down and remind us that we are doing a great work. And we ain't coming down. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen.